This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. They would not have stayed around. There would have been a trial, uh, or, or at least a, a, a killing, of all of these Roman soldiers, and that would have been recorded in history also. This theory about the stolen body misses some important points. The disciples were hiding for their lives. They were already disillusioned, they were already defeated, and they were scared. They were in no condition to attempt to steal a body from a sealed grave guarded by a Roman contingent. That wasn't going to happen. Well, what if, what if the Jewish or Roman authorities moved Christ's body to keep it from being stolen? What if? What if the soldiers themselves stole the body? Well, then they would have known where the body was. And a few days later, when the disciples were in the streets of Jerusalem, just a few days later, preaching the resurrection of Jesus, they could have produced the body saying, hey, we moved the body. He didn't rise from the grave. You guys are frauds. And that would have been the destruction of the birth of Christianity. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen that way. The third theory that's often given is the swoon theory. I love this one. The swoon theory. In fact, there's books written about it. I think there's a movie about it. You know, I mean, there's just all of this stuff about the swoon theory. And the idea here is that Jesus didn't die. He merely fainted from exhaustion and loss of blood. And everybody thought he was dead, but later he resuscitated. He didn't resurrect. He resuscitated, and the disciples thought that it was a resurrection. Interestingly, David Friedrich Strauss, who is uh, an agnostic, certainly no believer in the resurrection, an absolute proclaimed skeptic, had this to say about the swoon theory, uh, theater, swoon theory. This is what he said. It is impossible that, being, uh, that a being who has stolen half dead out of the sepulcher, who crept about weak and ill, wanting medical treatment, who required bandaging, strengthening, and indulgence, and who still at last yielded to his sufferings, could have given to the disciples the impression that he was a conqueror over death and the grave, the prince of life. Such a resurrection could have only weakened the impression which he had made upon them in life and death, but could by no possibility have changed their sorrow into enthusiasm and elevated their reverence into worship. This is a non-believer, an agnostic saying this. He said, no, 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 the swoon theory doesn't make any sense at all. Furthermore, remember that Jesus had been beaten mercilessly. I mean, he had been beaten without, I mean, he wasn't even recognizable, the Bible says. You couldn't tell that he was even human, he was beaten so badly. His beard had been ripped out. He had taken so many lashes on his back that wearing a robe would have been excruciating, if not impossible. The swelling and the bruising and the oozing open wounds would have been grotesque, hardly commanding proof that he had risen from the dead. Hardly any reason to believe that he would be alive forevermore. In fact, Thomas was so unsure, he was one of the disciples, Thomas, was so unsure that Jesus could have survived or that he was resurrected that he asked to see the evidence of the nail scars, implying, of course, that the resurrected one was an imposter. I'm not going to believe it. i got to see nail scars. Hi, well, come on, guys. Come on, really. John 20, verses 25 through 29 is the account there. So the other disciples told him, that's Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Now I want you to stop right there real quickly. Thomas was Jewish. Jews had laws. And one of those laws was that you didn't touch open wounds. If you did, you had to go through the ceremonial cleansing process. For example, when you prepared a body, as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had done, they had to go through a whole cleansing process after. That's why you don't see them. That's why they're not mentioned here. That's one of the reasons they're not mentioned here, because they were going through a cleansing process. They were completely out of the picture at this point, because they had been separated from the people. There were laws. And if you touched open wounds, you had to go through the ceremonial cleansing process. And Thomas knew that. And Thomas is saying, yeah, you know what? I'd stick my, you know, I gotta see wounds. I gotta see nails. I gotta see wounds. Now, a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, and though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. 
Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas did something unthinkable. He touched his hands, and he reached his hand inside the wound on his side where, he had, where Jesus had been speared. Now let me tell, suggest something. If it had been an open wound, it wouldn't have done it. It would have been a violation of Jewish law. But in fact, what he was seeing was a healed up wound, a scar that was healed. Jesus was standing before him completely healed. There was no bruising. There was no swollen, uh, swollen skin. There were no, there were no grotesque uh, hematomas. There was no open wound. He was completely healed, standing before his disciples, strong, convincing proof that he was alive forevermore. There was no sense that he had, he had just swooned and was just resurrected and gotten a blood transfusion and now he was fine. And Thomas takes his hand and puts his hand in this side that had been healed up. And Thomas responds, my Lord and my God. He wouldn't have said, my Lord and my God, about a man who had an open, weeping, bleeding wound. My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, and Jesus says something about you here. He says, he says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That's you. Looking for a Bible study that's focused on the practical application of the Bible? Check out our website at theopenclass.com.